Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you. Um, just going to move this. Uh, my name's Ed, and um, I am a curate here at St. Paul's. That's fine. For one more week. Um, that's fine. Don't worry. Okay. Rick's thinking of like what his needs would be, given his own eyesight and age. Um, uh, <laughs> <coughs> Thanks, Rick. I appreciate that. It's a little bit high now. It's a bit, whoa. Um, it, uh, so um, I'm married to Fuzz. For those who don't know me, um, Fuzz is over there, and she's going to come uh, and be up, up here a little bit later on in the service. And um, I've got four boys, uh, the youngest of whom is uh, eight months old, and the oldest is eight years. So uh, um, just giving you a bit of background, because I know there's a lot of visitors here today. I'd love for you to, to sort of know where we're coming from and where we're heading to um, uh, after today. So I've been a curate here for the last three and a half years, which means I've been, um, I'm, I was ordained um, back in uh, June of 2009, uh, and I was sent here to train as a vicar under Rick's leadership uh, and under your kind of tutelage, I suppose, I'd have to say. So you've been training, you've, you've been schooling me and preparing me and us as a family for the future ministry that God's calling us into. And it's been an amazing three and a half years. We're so blessed to have been here. It literally is the best place to do a curacy in the whole of the country. And I say that, and, and I mean it. Uh, there, um, and perhaps part of the reason for that will become clear as, as I go along. Um, not that I'm anything special, but, but what God is doing here is amazingly special. And what God is doing through you and in this part of London is pretty unique. And we've been so blessed to be a part of it. And um, today we're going to be um, commissioned and prayed for by you a little bit later in the, in the service. And we'll be sent off with a team of um, uh, 19 adults and um, There'll be 13 children um, uh, going as well. And we'll be going to the Isle of Dogs to a, a church there to begin a new start in that, in that church. And the reason that St. Paul's is able to do this today is because God has got hold of our hearts. And the Lord Jesus has spoken to us about this key principle in the Christian life. This key principle. And it's... The concept that we are more blessed when we give away than when we receive. That there is something more wonderful about giving away and generosity than there is about holding on to things and counting our, 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 our um, possessions and our, and our life as being precious to ourselves. And because this church has, has, has kind of grappled with that principle and is wanting to experience more of it, we've seen God do uh, wonderful things through us. And, and we'll talk a little bit about those as we go through. But um, we see the principle at work in the passage that Rick read to us a moment ago. So if you, if you do have um, a Bible, it might be great to, to keep that open to page 994. And we're just going to look at this encounter that Jesus has with uh, a, a rich, young ruler who approaches him uh, at one point. What we find as we look in this passage is that there are some things that people cannot give up to follow Jesus. There are certain kind of bottom lines, non-negotiables, that they are unwilling to surrender they feel it's their right or they feel it's their, their just kind of um, deserts that they've worked for something and they're not willing to surrender it for following Jesus. And it, and, and it might be a whole number of things. And in the case of this ruler, the key problem was wealth. And so as we get into this little encounter, let's read it again. Um, this ruler comes to Jesus uh, as he's teaching and he says to him, Good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus' response is this. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus wants to start by um, questioning the premise with which this man is coming to him. You see... This man knows that he's, he's um, 
upright and keeping the laws and doing the right things. And he's done well with his life. And he's pleased with how he's doing. But he wonders if there's more that he could be doing. If there possibly is anything more that he ought to be doing in order to be right with God and to have eternal life. And so he approaches Jesus. And his perception of Jesus is that he's a good teacher. And you know what? That is actually quite a common uh, perception of Jesus that is present today, 2,000 years later. There's loads of people that would look at Jesus and say, he's a really good teacher. He's, he, he, he's, he's spoken very wise words. He's in that kind of category with, with, um, with Gandhi and, and other great teachers of, of, um, of history. His moral teaching is, is, is worth listening to. We need to listen to the words of Jesus. He's a good teacher. But Jesus would want to question that premise just as he would for this ruler because he says to him, hang on a minute, who are you calling good? There's only one who is good, God. And he would in effect be saying, you're right, I am good, but the only reason I am good is because I am God incarnate, is because I am God in human form. And so there's no kind of getting on the same wavelength with me here. I'm in a different category. I think the ruler wanted to kind of make himself uh, on a par with Jesus and say, you know, you and me are not so different. We're we're, we're, we're both very ethical. We're very driven by um, wanting to have a good moral life. So just tell me kind of any extra tips from one to another that you'd like to impart today. Jesus says, there's no one good except God alone. But then he goes on from there to say, well, you know the commandments. Let's just start with those. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. And the ruler says, yep, all of those I've kept since I was a boy. I've got absolutely no problem with those. To which Jesus lets that go and he says, well, that might be the case. I'm not going to make a judgment about that. I think Jesus' judgment would be, actually, I'm not so sure that's true. Don't forget, Jesus is teaching when he's um, in Matthew, in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, where he, he applies the law of the Old Testament, and he talks about these very things. Don't commit adultery. And he takes those to a whole other level, and he says, as far as I'm concerned, Jesus is saying, It's not about actually sleeping with somebody who isn't your wife. It's actually about the way you look at another person of the opposite sex. That is about committing adultery. You need to take the law that God has given you and take it to a whole new level if you really want to understand what God requires of you. But he doesn't go there with this young ruler. He decides that he's going to nail him on the one big problem that he has. So he gets straight to the point. And he lets those things go and he says, you still lack one thing. And it's a big thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. You see, for the ruler, the big problem that he had was that he was wealthy. He had money, he had stuff. And we see from his response, well, that it was a problem. Because in verse 23, when he heard this, he became very sad because he was wealthy. He's devastated by what Jesus is saying. Because he thought that Jesus was going to talk a little bit more about morals, a little bit more about um, doing good works and kind of religious activities. And Jesus says, there's a much bigger problem than just making sure you've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's in your religious life. There's a big problem that is preventing you from having the life that God wants you to have. And it's this. You're so wealthy that you're bound up in your possessions and in your things. And we see it's true. The, the man is devastated. He, he can't handle this. And it, and it kind of makes us have to ask the question, you know, what would we be unwilling to give up to follow Jesus? 
It might well be that for us it is our possessions, our wealth. After all, you know, by the, by the, um, the standards of this man here, we're all pretty wealthy. Just think about the fact that he lived 2,000 years ago and a flushing toilet would have been like a, a novel invention. Okay, and yet he's described as a rich young ruler. Okay, so based on those standards, we're all pretty rich. We might like to look around us and say, no, no, I'm not rich. That's what rich, that's what wealth looks like. That's what to be really wealthy looks like. You know, that person up the road or that person driving that car. But really, if we look at ourselves and we look at what we have, we all have so much. And probably one of the biggest stumbling blocks to, um, to us, to, to people following Jesus today, is the fact that we are so consumed with possessions and with kind of accumulating more things in our lives. And that can become a barrier between us and God. And the reason is because anything that comes in the way of you and your maker the Lord God, is something which is described as an idol in the Bible. And we might kind of think, well, idols, schmeidels, you know, those were things from 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago that people used to bow down and worship and they were made of stone. They looked a little bit like funny little creatures. Um, And I certainly do not do that. I'm not interested in worshipping an idol. I'm not really interested in in doing, in worshipping anything. I just want to live my life. But it fails to, 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 to grapple with the truth, which is that we are all worshippers. We are all worshipping all the time. The question is not, are you somebody that worships an idol or not? The question is, as a worshipper, what are you worshipping? Because if you're giving yourself, if you're giving your time and your energy and all of your strength and, uh, and all of your hopes to anything other than, than the living God, then you're into idolatry. An idol is anything that takes the place of God. And often it'll be something really good. So it, it might be, um, you, know, you know, health, being, wanting to be really healthy. Um, but if you give yourself to that so passionately that you can't think of anything else and it takes precedence over all other things and over your relationship with God, then it is an idol. It might be. Um, it might even be family. If you're so consumed with um, with with catering for the needs of the people around you and those who you love, that you fail to to reflect on the fact that they are a gift from God, and that one day you'll have to let them go, and your relationship with them is going to change, and you can't handle that fact, then they're probably an idol in your life. Idols can come in so many forms. You know, this, just this week we've seen the idolatry of success and sporting prowess being totally stripped bare and kind of revealed for what it is. And the revelations about Lance Armstrong and, and his, um, uh, his admission of uh, taking um, performance-enhancing drugs for many, many years and concealing and being deceptive. It is pretty horrific. For him, everything had to be sacrificed to being the most successful, to being the best. And when it's kind of unveiled for what it is, and when the mask is stripped off, it looks pretty ugly. And it's kind of sad as well. And to see the way that Lance Armstrong is trying to get back on the horse, he wants to get back into competitive sport, he can't give it up. Even when his idol has been destroyed and smashed, he can't give it up. That's the thing about idols. They they have a grip over us. And they demand our service, and when they fail to satisfy, they break our hearts. So the question for us today, and maybe for you today, is what are you unwilling to give up? What are you unwilling to give up? But do you know what? What is impossible with humans is possible with God. That's the amazing message that Jesus has to say, because everybody looks at at what Jesus is saying to this man and, and says, how, is, how can we possibly be saved? How can anybody get into the kingdom of God? And Jesus kind of tries to break the mood a little bit and say, don't worry about it, don't be too intense. 
Um, and he, cracks, he cracks a little joke about camels and, and the eye of a needle. Um, he's, and he's kind of saying, yeah, it is absolutely impossible, humanly speaking, just like trying to get a cow through in the, the eye of a needle. I mean, it's that, it's that absurd in a sense, in human terms. But then he says, for God, the impossible is possible. God can actually do something in our hearts which takes away our desire to worship other things and puts God back in the first place. And the reason that is possible is because of what God himself has done for us. You see, just as we find it so hard to give up our riches and to give it away, for others, because they can often have a hold on us. God did exactly that. God gave up his riches so that we could become rich. And there's a verse in that Paul, um, the Apostle Paul writes to a church in Corinth, and, and he says, you know the grace, the generosity of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, even though he had the riches of heaven and the fullness of being God, yet for your sake, he became poor. He gave it all up. He gave it all away to us so that through his poverty, you might become rich. There was a substitution the most miraculous and wonderful divine transaction that took place when God became a human. And Jesus, though he was so rich, gave up all his riches. And he spent himself, and he spent himself entirely when he died on the cross. He gave up life itself. He surrendered everything. He became totally poor. So that we who are stuck in our own possessions, in our own idols, can be freed of them and can become rich again. Can have the riches of eternity. Can have the riches that Christ alone can offer. God did that in Christ for us so that we can be free. So that we can be freed from all the other stuff that would keep a hold on our lives and can live for God and enjoy him alone for all eternity. You see, this ruler knew there was a nagging knowledge at the back of his mind that he hadn't done enough. That's why in the first place he comes and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I'm doing, I'm doing all the things I feel I've been told to do. I'm obeying the commandments. I'm trying to keep all the rules. But there's something in me which knows it's not enough. And Jesus says, no, it's not enough. You've got to get rid of all the stuff, all of the idols, all of the things that you worship, and just worship God. Just receive the gift of God freely given. And that's true for every single one of us today. We can't be free until we've received the gift of God in Jesus, which he has offered to us. His death on a cross in our place so that we can be free of all of the things that keep a hold on our lives and we can receive his life instead. And as a church at St. Paul's, we've, we've received so much from God and we've begun to learn this principle that we can give it away because it's God's gift to us in the first place. And that's why we've, under Rick's leadership and because of God opening opportunities and doors, we've been able to, to restart churches um, all over um, Tower Hamlets, in, up in Bethnal Green, over in Bow. The church, um, uh, the, those three churches, St. Paul's, um, All Hallows Bow and St. Peter's, between them have grown by probably about 800%. It was 650% a year ago. Um, there's been more growth since then, so it's probably at least 800% because of this desire to keep giving away, to generously give away. And we're going to do it again next week. 
you guys are going to give away. You're going to give us away and send some of your best people with us so that we can sow into uh, a new community the love of God, the generosity of God. This totally topsy-turvy and yet the right way up understanding of the world that we can't keep everything forever anyway. It's all going to go. It's all going to burn. And so we radically reorientate our lives. We put God first. We give it all away to serve him so that he can give us the riches of eternal life. And my prayer for St. Paul's as we go is that you carry on, each of us individually, each of you individually, and collectively as God's people here, as the church of St. Paul's, just keep going in that calling that God has given you, in that revelation and that understanding that your eyes have been opened and you know that you're more blessed when you give than when you receive. That your giving away is part of your ongoing receiving of from the Lord that he has done so much for you that you love to overflow with that goodness and with that love and with that generosity to those around shall I pray for us fantastic so um, I think people have gotten it but just tell us um, in a couple of sentences what, what you're going to do next week and from then on. All right, brilliant. There's a little church in the, on the Isle of Dogs called St. Luke's, and it's been there for about 120 years, uh, but it's in a bit of a um, decrepit state, so they're building a new church building, and there's a congregation of about 15 people who are still there, been faithfully keeping it going, and they've invited us to come and bring a, a team with us and to lead that church. So it's the first time they've had their own minister in that church for maybe 40 years I haven't done the exact stats but it's a long time since they've had their own kind of leader and um, we just feel that this is God's call to us he's opened the door and the opportunity Uh, it's an amazing part of London with so much change going on so that's what we're going to go and do and uh, yeah there's a video as well yes we'll do the we'll play the video in just moments um first of all um I um uh, well, we would love to say just a huge thank you to Ed and Fuzz and their family for everything that they've done here at um, St. Paul's. Um, they've been with us for over three years. They have um, started a number of things which um, are actually now part of the parcel of everything that goes on here. So the children's church, we had an embryonic children's church before, but actually Fuzz really has invested in it and just made it um, just an amazing church, um, children's church for our um for St. Paul's, and it's just been totally amazing. And so, um, and actually, we have Jessica, because uh, who's our children's worker, because of all that Fuzz has done. And so, um, Fuzz, we're grateful to you. Um, we're grateful as well to both of you for the community fun days that are now part and parcel of our church calendar, where so many people from around here who would never ever normally come into a church have started um, coming to those days. <coughs> Excuse me, and in some cases, kind of taking that on. Fuzz's work in um, helping Louie with Mums and Tums, Ed's work in com- preaching and teaching and leading and uh, running the connect groups for many years. So there are so many, so many things that we're grateful to you. And um, your boys have just, add, you've just brought so much life and fun to us as well. And so we're very grateful to you too. We will miss you running around and um, uh, leading the rest of us running around. So um, we'll miss you so much too. So we'd love to give you a gift and... Um, a little something from uh, from us here, and there's a card as well. Do you want to just get that card? Yeah, which is um, uh, a wonderful Inga Lanaro creation. You can even see that from here, and um, this is just um, to you. And um, uh, if you'd like to, uh, yeah, one open it later. Or we can open it, and, just, and we're going to show a video. Amen. Amen. Great, let's give God a massive clap and let's give them a massive clap. Brilliant.